Welcome to Toy Other Time with Timmy the Tool Man and Sean. Today we have a special guest, my old buddy Don from my bike racing days. Don was actually a professional mountain biker. Don represented the U.S. in the first Olympic Games that featured mountain biking in 1996 in Atlanta, Georgia. So what we're going to do for Don today is we're going to install an archive garage complete suspension kit for the rear of his double cab 2006 Tundra, first gen Tundra. And we're going to walk you through all the steps necessary to get this done. But before we get out to the truck, let's show you all the stuff he got for this suspension upgrade. Don bought a very complete kit from Archive Garage. It includes the U-Bolt flip kit with new bump stops. It includes some new leaf springs. It includes the shock relocation kit. And it includes the hammer hangers. In addition to the Archive Garage components, Don bought some Fox 2.0 shocks with external reservoirs that's going to give him 12 inches of travel. All right, that's everything Don got for this suspension upgrade. Now we're going to get out to the rig, and the first thing we're going to do is work on the steps necessary so we can lift the bed off of the chassis so we have way more room to work to get all this stuff installed. Let's get started. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to try to disconnect a couple wires that run from the body to the bumper because we don't see a necessity to remove the bumper as part of this job. We just want to get the whole truck bed off. So I'm going to take off the two screws that hold the license plate on and see if we can access those wires to disconnect them. So we have this. That was easy. This is his little backup camera. And then the other two that I think we're seeing are these license plate lights right here. So you just take out the screw and then pop this out. And then we could just twist the bulb and get it out. Easy peasy. Looks like that one's burned out. Or it looks like one of them burned out in the past. Okay, so we got all the wires disconnected. We think we have to disconnect, but we'll have to do a double check and make sure. Okay, so to remove these cables, you just have to lift this tab up, slide it forward, and it pops right out. And then as far as the tailgate goes, you set it at about a 45 and just pull it straight out. And off it comes. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get this plastic bezel around the license plate out of the way because we still need to be able to feed the license plate lights out and they're kind of captured right now. So I think this thing just pops in here. There it is, easy peasy. And then you look, look on the back side. Now we can totally free the license plate lights. Just let them hang. Okay, we'll just throw this back here. We're gonna lower the spare tire to the ground using the stock winch tools and Don's going to do that right now. Basically we just insert this all the way back. There's a, a slot back there that you have to get this into. And there it is. And then we just crank this. Just lower it down. And then once you've loosened the cable enough, you can reach into the center and pull the sucker out. Don is retracting the winch cable and I'm holding a little pressure on this so it doesn't get wound up loose. On the driver's side frame rail, we have this wiring harness that runs along and gets clipped in several locations and then it runs to the body. And since we're lifting the body off, we have to disconnect the wiring harness from the body here and then a few other places. So it's just a plastic clip and I should be able to get it with my needle nose pliers here. Okay, that's disconnected. There's a third one over here. Okay, that one's disconnected. So that's free of the body. Oh, there's another one here. Okay, so that's all hanging. There's a connection over here on the back corner on the driver's side that we have to make a disconnect at. This connection is a little bit hard to, to disconnect, so I'm gonna release the clip that holds it to the body to where I can get my hands on it better. I can't squeeze that thing, man. I'm not manly enough to squeeze that thing. You wanna try it, Don? Sure. Yeah, give it a shot, man. Yeah, you're in the Olympics, so yeah. you, I know you can do this. <laughs> there we go, we got it, we got oh, it. USA, dude, for the win. Yeah, we're all good. We have another connector we have to disconnect in the passenger side rear corner. 
This is probably an optional thing, but there's an electrical connection on this driver's side tail light for the backup camera. So we have to access it by removing the rear tail light lens. And there's two 10 millimeter bolts I'm gonna take out. Oh, this is where it connects right here. So if I twist these out. Yeah, just remove the bulbs. It's gonna be self-explanatory which ones go where. Just remember the red one goes to the top and the green is the bottom, right? Yeah. Yeah, just red and then the orange one goes in the center. Then I'm just gonna feed this down. There's one connection right here that I'm gonna have to get loose right there from underneath. Now we're gonna work on disconnecting the gas filler pipe from the body. Underneath the rig, there's a bracket that attaches the filler neck to the frame. We just have to take two 12 millimeter nuts out for that. There we go, that's free. Now that we've got that done, all we have to do is pop out this for the cap and then remove the cap. Now that the cap's off, I can pull this filler neck free of the body. Now we're gonna remove the six Torx head bolts that hold the bed to the frame. I'm gonna use my 3 8 impact gun to do that with a 55 Torx socket. This one was a bit stubborn, so I'm gonna to go to the bigger gun, the Milwaukee half inch drive. Just like downtown. All right, instead of just getting a bunch of manpower, human muscle, we're gonna see what we can do with this engine hoist and some ratchet straps. This truck bed has hooks in each corner. So we have ratchet straps going diagonal to each other and cinched up pretty taut. And then we've got the engine hoist extended out the furthest it can go to the half ton range. And then we have the chain of the hoist with another strap capturing the two crisscrossing ratchet straps. And now we're gonna see if we can get some lift with the engine hoist and then lift it up far enough to where Don can just get in the driver's seat and drive away with the truck bed suspended. And then we're gonna lower the bed down to the ground and settle it. Since we're at a slight slope in my driveway, we chopped a couple of the wheels of the hoist so it doesn't start rolling downhill away from us. So here we go, we're gonna start lifting. You got movement? Yeah. Yeah, it's flopping around now. And then another thing is we have Don on one side and Sean on the other side, just taking a second look to make sure we didn't forget to disconnect something that goes from the body to the frame. One issue here is it's gonna move back and then hit the bumper. So we're going to kind of hold it this way and get past it. Okay. So we'll see if we can go up on it. Yeah. What was that? Is it hooked up or is it getting stuck there? Yeah, it's rubbing the bumper. If, if two of us push mm -hmm. and the other one lifts, we can get it. Yeah, I'm over the bumper. Think so? Yeah, I'm, I'm already above the bumper. in the front too. I think you're hitting the bumper. Take a look when we're doing this though, what's happening in the front? Yeah. Good in the front. Well, the filler pipe's free now. I would go up a little more, Sean. So you can clearly see that we have the bed of the truck free of the frame. Now what Don is gonna do is just get in the driver's seat and drive away with this thing suspended. Because we don't have the weight of the bed equalized very well, it's really front heavy. So what Sean and I are gonna do is we're gonna lift up right here so the tires will clear and then he's gonna drive away and hopefully not run over our feet. Because I like my feet. <laughs> Good shot. Stop, stop. Stop. We need 
to go up higher. Okay, okay. Grab your side, Tim. Okay, go. What we came up with to settle the bed onto the ground is we use some old recycling buckets. Another option would be to get four five gallon buckets and have one in each corner and then you could settle it down and the buckets can easily support the weight of this bed, no problem. We're gonna keep the hoist connected to it just in case these old recycling buckets fail. It's still supported by the engine hoist. As part of the kit, it comes with an extended steel braided brake line. So I'm gonna break it free right here. It's a 10 millimeter. I'm using a flare nut wrench. That's what you wanna use so you don't strip it. And then I'm gonna be ready with a 7 seconds vacuum cap to cap the end of the line so we don't lose a bunch of brake fluid. Okay, that's loose. I'm gonna to switch to an open end 10 millimeter to expedite loosening this because it's a little sticky. And then I'm gonna slip the 7 seconds vacuum cap over the flared end. It doesn't go over the threads. With the brake line disconnected, now I'm gonna remove this clip to where I can free the brake line of this part of the frame. Now I'm gonna use a 17 millimeter flare nut wrench to spin the line out of this T-fitting. Okay, it's loose enough. Now I can spin it out with my hand. We're gonna get the new one installed and I'm just lining up the threads and then I have to just spin the whole cable to get it connected. This fitting is smaller than the OEM one. It's a 14 millimeter. And that's good and tight. Now we have to fit this end into the tab on the frame and capture it with the clip. This clip wasn't holding the brake line very sturdy here. So Sean came up with a good idea. We put a little bit more of a bend in this clip and then now we think it's gonna hold a little tighter. Yep, definitely, that's holding way tighter. Good job, Sean, you're not as dumb as you look. So take my vacuum cap off and then get this started. We've got the hard line screwed into the soft line and on the back side, I'm supporting another fitting with a 19 millimeter flare nut wrench because this little clip isn't enough holding power to get it tight. And that's good and tight. We jacked up under the differential, got the wheels off the ground, and we're using these big jack stands that I have that are super tall to where it will reach under the bumper support of the frame. And now we're gonna get the tires off. And we also have the front tires chalked so the vehicle can't roll anywhere. I'm first going to pull off the decorative cover with a small pry bar. And these lug nuts are 21 millimeter. I'm going to zip them out with my Milwaukee half inch impact gun. All right, we're going to do the same with the other side. So we learned on the driver's side of how to disconnect the old leaf spring, grind off a bunch of fasteners so we can remove the old hanger, put the new hammer hanger in place, and then get the new leaf spring installed. And it was quite a battle. And so hopefully this side's gonna go smoother since we learned a few things and we're gonna share those things with you. We already removed the shock because we needed to do that to get a little bit more manipulation of the rear end to be able to get that new leaf spring in. It's starting to spin, so I'm gonna grab a hold of the shock shaft. Okay, I've got it clamped with my big channel locks and now I'll be able to get it up. You can pry the lower shock from the bracket by using a pry bar. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna show you all the steps that we did on the other side. So we're gonna get this leaf spring disconnected first. I'm gonna take off the 19 millimeter nuts that secure the U-bolts to this bottom plate. Get off me, Holmes. Okay, we got your U-bolts, got the little bump stop, and then 
can't remember what the term of this is. Chingadera, thingamajigger. I'm gonna disconnect the leaf spring from this rear shackle. It's also a 19. I'm gonna hold the head of the bolt in case the whole bolt starts spinning. I'm gonna take this one out too. Now we're gonna to jump to the front and we're gonna loosen that one. The muffler was getting in the way of my bigger gun, so I switched to a 3 8 gun with a 19 millimeter socket and see if I could zip this out. This bolt is a little stubborn. The bigger gun would have got it, but I couldn't get it in there, so I'm gonna use this big box end wrench. Okay, now it's loose. Now I could spin it out with the gun. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna lower the rear end a little bit. Right now we have my Badlands jack right underneath the center of the rear axle. So Don's just gonna lower it a little bit to where there's no more pressure from the rear axle on this leaf spring. So there's no pressure on that now. We should be able to knock these bolts out. In theory, maybe we'll get the rear ones first. There we go. Pick up a little bit on it. I could get this bolt out. Now that's free. And then, Don, you want to manipulate it while I play around with this one? Pick up on it a little bit. Not going out. I need the mallet then. I'm going to tap it with the mallet. There we go. Pick up on it a little bit. Flex it. There we go. I'm going to hit this with the plastic mallet to knock it out of its hanger here. Now for the really fun part. We have to grind these things down all the way flush with this hanger with our DeWalt angle grinder because these aren't a bolt that you can remove. They're some type of rivet, I guess. I don't know how to explain it. Some type of- Clamps it into place. Yeah, it's just almost it's like, like a, a rivet. rivet yeah, it it, it's kind of like a pop rivet, but it's a big heavy duty bolt and the end here is mushroomed out. The only way you can get that sucker out is by grinding it down to where it's totally flush. And then we use an air hammer and we drive it out of the frame. So we'll just show you a little bit of grinding one and then we're just gonna cut and return after we've ground all these flat so we can knock them out with the air chisel. I have a grinder wheel on this DeWalt gun you just have to work it back and forth to where you can flatten this entire exposed mushroom bolt in, I guess, if you want to call it. The sparks can be pretty hot. At a minimum, want to be wearing some gloves. These aren't the greatest. You might even want to wear long sleeves because the metal debris coming off is kind of hot. Use whatever personal protection that you think is necessary. And you definitely want to use eye protection. Once you get them all ground down flush with this plate, it's hard to see it. You won't be able to see it on the camera, but if you're looking at it with a light, you can just barely see the outline of that bolt. To get it started to where you could see the edges of the bolt a little better, you could strike it with a punch. So you can see on this bottom one, you can see a little bit of an outline of the bolt right there and I'm just trying to hit that to expose it a little bit to where I'm pretty sure that when I get on here with the air hammer I'm going to be air hammering the bolt and just not hitting the plate. We're going to switch to the air hammer and see what that gets us. So you saw we were finally able to knock out those mushroom bolts, I'm calling them, out of the frame with the air chisel. If you don't have an air hammer like we did, then what the instructions suggest is you drill a hole, a small pilot hole, and then you keep on stepping it up to where you can drill the whole thing out. I like the air hammer better. I don't think I want to sit there and drill after I just spent a bunch of time grinding. It's not a fun job. Maybe this is an excuse to get you yourself an air chisel. I highly recommend. The next thing that we have to do is we have to enlarge these holes 
to a half inch. So I have a half inch drill bit on my Milwaukee drill and we're gonna drill these up. Just like on the other side, we saw a little bit of rust underneath this old hanger. So we're gonna use a flap disc on my DeWalt angle grinder, clean it up. We shot this with a paint and primer combo and while the paint is drying, we're gonna work on getting the bushings set up on the leaf spring. This rear shackle has a Zerk fitting so you can grease it. And we're gonna grease this with some super lube. And we're just gonna squeeze it until we see the grease coming out of these slots. There we go. A little more. There we go. See, it's squeezing out both sides. There's two different diameter bushings. The bigger ones go on this side of the leaf spring and it marries up with the shackle. So this is the rear connection. It's gonna go like that. And this smaller one goes on the front. So the end of the shackle with the smaller diameter that accepts the smaller bushing, that's the front side. That's the way you could tell them apart. Smaller diameter front side, larger diameter on the rear. For these bushings, you don't want any lube on this part of the bushing you want it on the inside. So I'm gonna use this Mission Automotive silicone paste to lubricate it. The kit does come with its own lubricant, but this is the same exact stuff. So I'm just gonna lubricate this really good. And then we just slide it in the leaf spring. Do the same with the other one. And then we gotta get our sleeve in. I'm gonna lubricate that also. Why not? And then we'll slide that sucker in. I almost had enough strength to push the sleeve in all the way, but I'm gonna tap it the rest of the way in with the plastic mallet. For this bolt that attaches the shackle to the leaf spring, you want the bolt coming in from the inside. So this is gonna be the passenger side leaf spring, so this is the right side. And then get the washer on and then the nut, and we're just gonna keep that loose. So same thing with these smaller diameter bushings. I'm gonna lubricate the inside and then slide them in place. I'm lubricating the sleeve and then I'm gonna slide it in. And that went in really easy. You also need to lubricate the face of the bushing. We pulled the shackle off so we can grease the face of these because we didn't do it. Then we'll put the shackle right back on. Next, we're gonna get the hammer hanger installed where the old hanger was. It comes with these carriage bolts. The instructions say to put some anti-seize on all four of the bolts. We're gonna push the bolt through and you can see that there's square holes that capture the carriage bolt head. On the back side, we're gonna put two plates. They capture two bolts each. So you're gonna put the plate on first and then you're gonna come in with the washer and then the nut. The nuts for these hammer hanger bolts is a 19 millimeter. I'm gonna cinch them up snug with my half inch ratchet and then I'm gonna to switch to the torque wrench. The torque spec for these nuts is 80 foot pounds. I'm just cleaning up the inside of this front hanger so it's just gonna be better for the new bushing. We're gonna spread some of that silicone paste on both of these faces and it's gonna help us slide the leaf spring in place and get the bolt holes aligned. I'm also gonna lubricate the inside of this hammer hanger just so the bushings will slide in easier. What we learned on the other side is it's hard to get this thing in. That's what we learned. There's three things that you have to get in alignment. You have to get the front connection with the frame tab aligned so you can get the bolt slid through. You have the rear shackle that has to get aligned with the new hammer hanger. And the third thing is you gotta get this dowel for the leaf spring aligned with the mount on the axle. So what we came up with is we're gonna get the front connection aligned first, then we're gonna get the rear shackle aligned with the hammer hanger. And then lastly, we're gonna get the dowel aligned with the leaf spring seat on the axle housing. So Don and I are working together. This sucker is heavy. I have my plastic mallet. I'm gonna hammer this in. It's working. 
I can see a little bit of the sleeve of the leaf spring, so I'm gonna use this alignment tool, see if I can pry it to get a better alignment. It needs to come back a little bit more. There we go. Got it closer. That's pretty close. Let's see if I can get that in. The bolt comes in from the inside out. It's almost there. There we go. There it is. Put the washer and then the lock nut. When we were doing the other side, we ended up resting the weight of the leaf spring on this ABS sensor. So we're gonna work a little smarter this time and I'm gonna disconnect the ABS sensor so we don't tug on it and maybe destroy it. This is held to the axle housing with a 10 millimeter bolt. You can pry up on this and get it out the rest of the way. There we go. So now this is fully out of the way and we're not gonna damage it. To be able to get the shackle closer to the hammer hanger, you can see we have the rear axle pretty darn low, pretty close to the ground. And both shocks are removed so we can get the rear axle lower. So this is pretty close. So all I have to do is flex this a little bit and then Don's gonna get the bolt started. You don't understand how much easier that was for us. We fought this big time. That bolt that we just got in, in two seconds, we struggled with that for a long time because the shackle was cocked a little bit and we can get it through the front side, but the back side closer to the frame rail, we weren't getting the alignment and we struggled, but that was a lot easier. So the wrenching gods are on our side. To be able to get the washer and nut on the other side, you can't have the bolt fully sunk in because you're not gonna be able to reach behind and get it. So you have to come in here and carefully get the washer on now that I got the washer on, I'm gonna set the nut back there and drop it. I got it started with my two index fingers. It could be a little bit of a test of patience, but you can do it. Okay, that started really nicely. So what we've got here is we have a ratchet strap hooked around the axle housing leading to his rock rails. If you didn't have rock rails, you could wrap the ratchet strap around a body mount right there that I'm pointing to. And then we have another ratchet strap going leaf spring to leaf spring so we can draw this leaf spring more inboard. Because when we first started, it was kicked out towards the brake drum and it was kicked out towards the back. So we tightened the ratchet strap that goes from the axle housing to the rock rail to bring the rear axle this way. And then we're also using this one to drag the leaf spring more inboard to align that dowel pin with the leaf spring seat. So we have to just tighten this one up a little bit more and I think we're gonna get it. Oh, there it is. We're gonna leave the ratchet straps in place while we get the U-bolts and the bump stop that goes on top in place. We're gonna set the bump stop. This hole goes over this nut right here. And then we're gonna come underneath with the U-bolts. And then we put a washer and a nut on each one. Now I'm just gonna grab my Milwaukee ratchet and cinch these up. When you install leaf spring U-bolts, you want the amount of exposed stud above the nut equal on both sides. So you just have to pay attention to that while you're tightening down the nuts. So I just have these lightly snugged up. They're not super tight. When we have the weight of the vehicle back on the tires, that's when we're gonna to torque these nuts to spec. On this driver's side, we are gonna show one thing. When I tried to remove the front bolt, it hits the gas tank skid. So I'm gonna remove the gas tank skid so I can completely free the bolt of the frame. It looks like there's four nuts, two in the rear and then two more towards the front. Let's see if we can remove this bolt now. There we go. 
The next thing we're gonna do is we have to cut out a section of metal here to be able to fit the new cross member in. And one of the shocks is gonna be riding right here. We're a little bit worried about hitting these brake lines when we're cutting. So we're gonna disconnect this bracket right here and then hopefully be able to pull the brake lines a little bit further away so we're less likely to cut into them when we're cutting on this side. This is held on with three 12 millimeter bolts and I'm gonna zip them out with the Milwaukee ratchet. I needed to switch to a, a short socket right here. They're captured in a clip right here. I'm gonna see if I can pull them out. That gives us a lot more room to cut. The instructions say to drill a hole in every corner so when you're cutting with the disc, you're gonna hit that hole and you're not gonna overshoot. So to give the drill bit a purchase point, I'm gonna use a center punch. I'm gonna start off with a 3 16 drill bit. Ooh. Oh, it just double thick right there. I stepped up to a 1964 drill bit and drilled out all four corners. Now I'm gonna use my DeWalt angle grinder with the cutting disc and start cutting away. Here's the section of metal that we cut out of the frame to make room for the shock to be able to come up through the hole and bolt up to this shock relocation crossbar that comes with the kit. And by looking at this, you can get a pretty good visual of where we cut. So I would say about one inch behind this shock hole. This looks like it's probably about an inch and a half to two inches below this hole right here. We carried the cut pretty close to the driver's side frame right here, pretty close to a quarter inch right here. And then you can see where we cut here. It's pretty close to the top of the bend here. We cut right at the edge of the bend here. And then what you're seeing here is I did some welding. This piece originally was all connected together, but now it was free floating. So we bent it down with a hammer. We clamped it with a clamp and then tacked it and then welded it. These two pieces of metal were separated and I put a bead right here too. This is a screw up that I did. I cut a little bit too far with the cutting wheel on my DeWalt angle grinder and I just welded up that cut. I was able to do most of the cutting with the DeWalt angle grinder with the cutting disc. When it got to here, the depth of these two pieces together was too deep for the wheel to get to. So we switched to my Milwaukee reciprocating saw and I was able to complete the cut in this area. And then to clean up the edges of the cuts, I used my Milwaukee die grinder with the grinder wheel. And then we also did a little bit of finishing with just some hand files. This wiring harness is clipped into the driver's side frame right here. I have to admit, I stupidly was cutting here with this still there and I was taking a pretty big risk. If I slipped with the blade, I could have sawed right into the harness and caused us a lot of headaches fixing wires. Go ahead and take the time to remove these clips out of the frame so you can get this whole wiring harness out of the way of the cutting and you don't have to worry about cutting into it. We did mention this. This was another good idea to disconnect this. I think this is the load sensing proportioning valve. We got this out of the way so we're less likely to cut into these brake lines. So now let's move over to the passenger side and we'll show you the cuts we made in the frame there. On this side, you have to do way less cutting. You just have to cut out a small section in here to make room for the shock. And we're gonna test fit it, and hopefully we've cut enough material up. If we haven't, then we'll have to just cut a little bit more material, grind it out. After we get done making sure all the edges are nice and smooth and not sharp, we're gonna shoot this with a combination primer paint so we reduce the chance of Don getting rusting on his frame. Before we work on getting the shock relocation crossbar in place, we're gonna cut off these lower shock mounts on the axle housing because we don't need them anymore. We're gonna be putting on different ones. You could use a reciprocating saw. You can use a cutting wheel. Because the cutting wheel is a little bit more aggressive and I wanna be careful not to cut into the axle housing, I'm gonna to choose to use a reciprocating saw. So I'm gonna use my Milwaukee hacksaw 
to cut pretty close to the axle housing, but leave a little material. And then I'll finish it up with the grinder to grind it flush and get all of the extra material off the axle housing. As you can see, no longer is there a lower shock hanger on this axle housing. We used a multitude of blades with my Milwaukee Hacksaw, a lot of battery swaps, and we cut off a lot of material. And then we finished it by getting a grinder wheel on my DeWalt angle grinder, and we ground it fairly close. And then we switched out the grinder wheel on the DeWalt angle grinder to a flap disc and got the rest of the material all the way smooth to the axle housing. Be patient, it takes a while. You want the old shock hanger completely removed and the metal ready to be welded for the new shock hanger we're gonna be putting on. Now we're gonna work on getting the shock relocation crossbar in place. The directions say to measure from this forward rectangular hole back three and a quarter inches and that's where the edge of the crossbar is gonna end up. And I also made a mark on the other side, on the driver side. So Don and I are gonna place this in position. All right, so this one on the passenger side is in place. I'll hand the mallet over to Don and he could get his in. After getting the crossbar in place and connecting up one of the Fox shocks, we decided to move the crossbar as far forward as the carriage bolt would allow. And so we were able to knock it forward another quarter of an inch because we wanna make sure we have enough clearance for the shock body right here. And so we were feeling better about having the crossbar a little bit more forward than the instructions said to do. So we went a quarter inch more towards the front of the vehicle. Now what we're gonna do is get a half inch drill bit and drill these holes. And we're gonna let this plate be our drill guide. We are most likely gonna ruin some of the powder coating, but we're thinking that that's the lesser of two evils. Cause quite often you mark a hole in the center, you center punch it, you go back and you put the plate back in and you notice that the holes aren't perfectly lined up. And then you're sitting there with a file or whatever, trying to make it better. We're gonna sacrifice a little bit of the powder coating to make sure we're gonna get two perfectly drilled holes on each frame rail. We've got the half inch holes drilled. Now what Don is gonna do is he's gonna shoot it with a little black paint and primer so it's less likely to rust on the inside of the frame. We've got these bolts installed through the frame rail, capturing the shock relocation cross member. You have a washer that goes under the head of the bolt and then you have a washer that goes with the lock nut. These are self-locking and you don't have to worry about these coming loose. This carriage bolt has a regular flange nut with no locking feature and no lock washer. So we chose to put a little 242 Loctite on that one just to limit the chance of it coming loose on Don. The instructions didn't give a torque value for all these fasteners, so we're gonna use a similar one that was used for the hammer hangers. We're gonna to torque these to 80 foot pounds. We have both of the Fox shocks attached to the crossover. We're noticing on the passenger side, there is some interference with the exhaust pipe. We did a little bending on this hanger right here. We bent this from pretty much going straight up at a 45 towards the passenger side, it gave us a little bit more clearance, it might be enough. In a perfect world, you might wanna pay a muffler shop to reroute this way away from the shock body so it's not ever gonna come in contact with it. Or you could just cut it off and have the pipe end right here if you want, it's up to you. But now what we're gonna do is we're gonna get the wheels back on, we're gonna lower the vehicle to the ground and then we're gonna start taking some measurements to figure out where we're gonna put the lower shock mount onto the axle housing. We called Eric, the owner of Archive Garage, and he gave us a hint for this part of the process. Once the rig is on its wheels and the full weight is on it, we're gonna take a measurement from the bump stop up to here. And then we're gonna add an inch and a half because that's how much 
the bump stop can compress. We're gonna take that value and use it to figure out where we're gonna put this on the axle housing. He told us if we copy that dimension that we just got for measuring from the bump stop to the frame and adding an inch and a half, if we get that much distance of exposed shock shaft showing, that should be pretty good. We're never gonna bottom out the shock. The goal is under full compression, you're not gonna bottom out your shock and destroy it. So that's what we're gonna do now. We're gonna get the wheels on, settle it to the ground, and start working on figuring out where we're gonna mount these suckers. We took a measurement from the bump stop to the frame, and what we come up with is right about six and a quarter inches. And then we have to add an inch and a half because the bump stop can compress on a full compression, an inch and a half. So that makes it seven and three quarter inches. We've got the floor jack supporting the lower shock mount and the shock is connected to that lower mount. And we're gonna measure to the little bump stop that's on the shaft. You don't necessarily have to include that, but we are deciding to include that just for a little bit of extra insurance. And what we get is eight and a quarter from that little rubber bump stop to the bottom of the shock body right here. So that's gonna give us a half an inch of protection from the shock bottoming out, but we actually even have a little more because we didn't include this little rubber bump stop on the shaft. So we actually have more than a half an inch of protection from bottoming out the shock, and that's where we're gonna keep it. The instructions also tell you to take a measurement from the inside of the U-bolt over towards the center, three and a half inches. And that's where the edge of the lower shock mount needs to line up. So you need three and a half inches from the shock mount to the inside of that U-bolt. And now we have everything lined up the way we want it. We're gonna get our welder out. We're gonna tack the lower mount in several places on the axle housing. Then we're gonna remove the shock from the lower mount and complete the welds. And then once we're done welding, we'll show you everywhere we welded. As part of this kit, we're gonna delete this hanger on the driver's side frame rail for the parking brake. And we're gonna use this hanger that comes with the kit and we're gonna bring the line down and hook it right to this leaf spring shackle bolt. And what this is gonna do is allow the rear axle to go to full droop without putting a whole lot of tension on the parking brake. So we loosened a 9 16th nut here, and now we're gonna drive this bolt out and then slip the bolt through this hanger and then reattach the nut. This original hanger is held on to the driver's side frame with a 12 millimeter bolt. I'm gonna zip it out with the Milwaukee ratchet. I'm gonna have to pry this small tab out of the way to where I can pull the two halves apart and free the bracket from the cable. There we go. And now that's free. You're free, free. Then I'm gonna grab the new one. Looks like it'll wanna go like that. Then we gotta knock the bolt out and capture it right there. I'm gonna have to drive this out with the punch. It's a little bit sticky. Oh, there we go, finally got it. So we're gonna decide to switch the orientation so it's gonna be easier in the future if we wanna remove this for any reason. We just have to take the nut off. We don't have to deal with actually taking the whole bolt out. There we go. I'm using a pair of pliers to assist me getting this nut started. Okay, it started. We're gonna install this extender bracket for this load sensing proportioning valve connection right here. So we're gonna take out two 12 millimeter bolts right here. We're gonna put this bracket in place and then we're gonna relocate this to these upper two holes, maybe the middle two holes. We haven't really figured it out yet, but we will. No torque spec for this. We're just gonna use that German spec we all know and love. Good and tight. Good and tight. The kit didn't come with bolts, so we're gonna probably just grab some M8 bolts, nuts, and washers and hook this sucker up. You know what I mean? 
Geraldine. Don and I are gonna make a trip to the local hardware store to get these bolts so we can attach this here. And then while we're gone, Sean's gonna use my Hobart welder and he's gonna complete the welds for these lower shock mounts. One precaution is they say you should drain the gear oil to avoid a fire. We're not necessarily going to do that, but we have the fill cap open to let pressure out. The key is you want to weld a little bit on one of the shock mounts and then go to the other one and weld on that one a little bit. You don't want to get one area super, super hot. That's what he's going to do. He's going to weld a little section on one, then jump over to the other side, weld that, and maybe even wait a little bit between welds to allow it to cool a little bit so we don't overheat the axle housing or ignite the gear oil inside. So the worst case scenario is you're gonna burn through the axle housing. So we're purposely welding at a little bit of a lower setting. These lower shock mounts are a quarter inch thick, but how thick the axle housing is in this particular location, we're not 100% sure. But we talked to a couple guys that are expert welders and we talked to the guy that owns Archive Garage and they all suggested to run the welder at a setting for 3 16 inch steel. So that's what we're gonna use as a guideline for the settings on the welder. We welded these all up. Sean did most of it. I did a little bit and the ones that look the worst are the ones that I did. So anyways, they're welded on there, they're secure, they're not gonna go anywhere. And then now we're gonna shoot these with some paint and primer so they don't rust. After we got the lower shock mounts painted up and all looking pretty, we got the shock reconnected to the upper mount here and we torqued the upper and lower shock bolts to 50 foot pounds. And then while we're here, I'll explain this. This mount right here was an extra reservoir mount that I had that I wasn't using. And so I gave Don a pair of these. The kit that he bought didn't come with a mount for the reservoir. So we're using my Radflow once. We drilled holes in the crossbar for the shocks. And then we just put a little a half inch spacer. And then we just used a standard bolt. I can't remember the size and we bolted it up. It's gonna go right here and then we're gonna have to put some hose clamps on either end to capture it. In the archive garage instructions, they show something like this, where it's hose clamped right here with some rubber or plastic spacers right there. We didn't get those as part of the kit. So we did the next best thing and put them here. And I actually think this is better because Don could easily access the dial here to adjust the dampening on this reservoir as opposed to if it was way over here, then you gotta like reach underneath the bed every time you wanna adjust your shocks, not so convenient. All right, we're getting really, really close to finishing this job. We have the truck lower to the ground, the wheels are back on, torque to spec. The spec we used is 85 foot-pounds and then Remembering that we disconnected a brake line and we put this new braided line on, we have to bleed the brakes. At the 11th hour, we tried to look it up, but we couldn't find the exact information. So we're just gonna go by what we know. We're gonna start at the furthest from the master cylinder and work our way towards it. So we're gonna do the right rear tire. We're gonna do this load sensing proportioning valve right here next. Then we're gonna do the left rear tire, then the right front, and then the left front. And I don't know if the key needs to be in the on position for this process for this Tundra, but we're gonna go ahead and do it anyway, just in case. Because the tires are on, a nice wrench to use to bleed brakes is an offset wrench. So I'm using a 10 millimeter offset wrench, and I'm Gonna slip it over my drain tube here. The drain tube is already on the drain nipple. And then I'll put the tube into my catch container. I'm gonna tell Don to pump the brakes. He's gonna pump the pedal about five times and then he's gonna hold pressure on the brake pedal and I'm gonna open up the bleeder and let some fluid and air out. He's gonna let the 
pedal settle to the floor and then hold it there until I tell him to pump it up again. Because if he lifts up his foot off the brake pedal while I have the bleeder open, that could suck air into the line and we don't want to do that. All right, Don, pump it up. And then tell me you're holding. Holding. Okay, pump it up again. Holding. Okay, pump it up again. During this bleeding process, you want to make sure you don't drain the entire master cylinder because if you do that, now you're going to have to bleed the master cylinder. So don't make your job harder by doing that. So keep track of the level. Right now, we're still pretty good and we're going to keep on bleeding for a little bit more. Now we're going to torque the leaf spring shackle bolts to 89 foot pounds. You're going to want the weight of the vehicle on the wheels before you do this because if you torque them with the vehicle suspended and the axle drooped then you're going to put the bushings in a bind under normal conditions so ideally you would put the bed back on and weight it with the bed and then torque it to spec because as the weight of the bed gets on this it's going to flex a little bit downward. But what we're going to do to cheat a little bit, Don and Sean are going to get on the back of the rig and weight it down, almost probably equal to the weight of the truck bed. So I have easier access to getting in here with my tools to torque these to spec. These are our 22 millimeter. Now we're torquing the nuts for the leaf spring u-bolts to 80 foot pounds one thing that the instructions did say is after you get them torqued if there's more than a half an inch of stud above the nut you should cut them off don's going to do that at a later date because it's getting kind of late and we're getting hungry and we want to drink beer and be merry or maybe be tim and don and sean so what I'm doing is I'm taking the slack out with my half inch ratchet. You don't want the U-bolt to where one side is higher than the other. So you want to cinch them up equally so you have an equal amount of stud above each nut. We are all done with this job. I'd have to say 
This was the most involved suspension upgrade I've done on any Toyota. Pretty damn involved. It took three of us two full days to knock this out. I wanted to tell you that just to prepare you if you get this kit, you're in for quite a bit of work. As you saw, we used an engine hoist to be able to lift the bed clear of the frame and then we drove the vehicle out from underneath it. And even with that tool, it still was really good to have one person on the hoist and two people on either side as we're jacking it up to make sure that everything is disconnected that needs to be disconnected so we're not pulling on anything. And then just make sure that it's clearing as it's going up because the way we got the ratchet straps in there, the front end was really heavy. So Don and I were actually lifting up on the front end while Sean was working the hoist and we were keeping it level with our man strength. So get some friends to help you with this. That's what I'm trying to say. You need some friends. If you don't have an engine hoist, then you're gonna need at least four people, one in each corner to lift that sucker off and then get it set on something safe. With this job, there was just a ton of grinding and cutting and touching up paint and what else? What am I missing? We did some welding, that was kind of fun. But it's just a lot of steps and a lot of time consuming things. You have to grind off all those mushroom bolts to get those leaf spring hangers off. And then you gotta drill holes to get the hammer hangers on. And then we struggled a little bit with one of the leaf springs, but then the second one that we showed you went in a little bit smoother because we figured it out with the ratchet straps. We went through DeWalt batteries, Milwaukee batteries. We used angle grinder, die grinder, drills, Sawzall. What else did we use? Yeah, we <laughs> used a brand new DeWalt tape measure that my buddy Don bought me. Should have got Don. <laughs> This was an involved suspension upgrade, but it looks like it's gonna serve Don well. The cool thing was that when we had questions, we called Eric, the owner of Archive Garage, and he answered the phone and spent a bunch of time with us on the phone to answer our questions. So we thought that was pretty cool. He stands behind his product by helping the people that buy his product with all their questions that they have. Time will tell how well Don likes this because he's got to go take it off some freaking 50 foot dune jumps. Send it. Send it, Don. Send it, Don. Send it, Don. Anyways, just know that even though this suspension upgrade is pretty damn cool, it's pretty damn involved for you to install. So just set aside a couple days or more depending on how many hours you want to put in each day we put in two pretty full days and we stayed pretty busy it did include a few trips to hardware store to pick up some bolts and stuff but pretty much we were working fairly consistently throughout the whole two days so if i didn't say it before this suspension upgrade for the rear of dawn's first gen tundra is going to give him 12 inches of suspension travel and that's about this much. Because I tell my wife every day that that's 12 inches. <laughs> hey, you got to use your new DeWalt measuring tape, okay? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Yep, 12 inches. <laughs> with all that said, we thank you for watching Toy at a Time with Timmy the Tool Man and Sean and special guest Don Myra, former Olympic team member of the 1996 Olympic team, one of two guys to first represent the U.S. in cross-country mountain bike racing, pretty badass. He's a nice guy, too. Peace out, happy wrenching, sick mods, and sick suspension upgrades on a first-gen Tundra. Bye-bye.